Hello and welcome to Nursing School Explained. Today's topic is COPD or Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. As always, let's look at the pathophysiology first. When chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we always have to distinguish between two different um, pathophysiological mechanisms that are going on um, here. One of them is emphysema and the other one chronic bronchitis. So let's look at emphysema first. So emphysema is caused by inhaled pollutants and most commonly that is smoke or any kind of other environmental pollutants such as um, smoke living close to factories, a lot of agriculture, those kind of things. And these inhaled pollutants over time destroy the elastin that the alveoli are made of. Therefore, when the elastin is destroyed, the alveoli lose their recoil ability after exhalation. So basically what that means, I've drawn it out here. So you have the airway and then the alveoli at the end. And typically the air comes in, the O2 comes in, gas exchange happens at the alveoli and then CO2 is exchanged. Well, when the alveoli here lose their elasticity, that elastic recoil, they're kind of a little bit more distended to begin with. And because they can't really kind of contract as they're trying to get rid of the CO2, they are not able to exhale or, or um, eliminate the CO2. And that means that the CO2 gets trapped here in the alveoli. And that's uh, right here, it, the small airways then collapse and leading to alveolar distension and that air trapping that I just explained over here. Which means that the CO2 can't exit and the O2 can't enter and therefore the patient will become hypoxemic. So less oxygen concentration in the blood. In comparison, chronic bronchitis is also a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder but it works a little bit differently. The causative organism or, or mechanism, again, is chronic exposure to smoke or the environment. But in chronic bronchitis, the bronchi, bronchi and bronchioles get inflamed. Now this inflammation, as we know, typically anywhere, especially in the lungs, causes increase in mucus production. And therefore the airway walls thicken causing an airway obstruction. So now we're having the problem where the air also can't escape because of the mucus and the thickened airway walls. And a chronic bronchitis diagnosis is usually made if there's a daily productive cough for three months for two consecutive years. So that's a long time exposure to any of these um, um, pollutants or smoke that cause all this, these things going on over time. And keep in mind, both of these are chronic diseases. So nothing happens um, really quickly here. This is a chronic exposure uh, and these changes happen very slowly over time. Now this would be in comparison, let's say, to acute bronchitis, which like an upper respiratory infection can lead to acute bronchitis. But today we'll stick with these chronic respiratory disorders. Now if we come back to emphysema, signs and symptoms, because the CO2 can't exit and the O2 can't enter, the patient will have shortness of breath and they'll have increased work of breathing, as well as they might have accessory muscle use. A lot of patients, um, because of this physiological mechanism that's going on here, it will be easier for them to breathe in the tripod position. And what that means is that they will usually lean forward if they're sitting in a chair. Sometimes they'll put their hands on their knees and it'll be a tripod. So their arms will be two parts of the tripod and then their head will be the second. So basically leaning forward allows them for more expansion and to, e to easier excrete that CO2. A lot of times patients with emphysema, they will be thin and they will have what's called a barrel chest and an increase in AP diameter. And that means anterior posterior diameter. Usually our torso is shaped where the diameter from anterior posterior here is, would be a one and then the lateral diameter would be a two. So our torso would be shaped, if I look at it from the top, 
would be shaped like this. So this is a one, and then this dimension here would be a two. So it's a two to one diameter. But in somebody with a barrel chest, because this happens over time, these alveola, every single alveolus this patient has, gets distended. So that takes up space. So over time, the chest, the shape of the chest reconfigures, and instead of this two to one, we now have a one-to-one -one ratio. So the diameter anterior, posterior, and lateral is the same. This is not the best drawing here, but their, their, their chest diameter will increase and now be the same as kind of like the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder measurement. So they will have that barrel chest as the description. A lot of times they'll have a reddish complexion and they also are called the pink puffers. And the reddish complexion happens because now we are hypoxemic and the body's uh, compensatory response is to produce more red blood cells because now we need more oxygen carriers to be able to perfuse the tissues that need the oxygen very direly and so the patients will have increase in red blood cells and they'll therefore look a little bit pinkish and the pink puffer is because a lot of times they'll do pursed lip breathing and we'll talk about that later in nursing considerations which helps them with that recoil of the alveoli to kind of exhale that CO2. It helps with that. And on physical assessment findings, patients with emphysema a lot of times will have diminished breath sounds because there's just no air movement, no air movement happening at the alveoli. And they will have a hyper-resonant chest on percussion. So if you put your finger um, and you percuss their chest, because there's so much more air in there, because of this air trapping, their chest wall will be hyper-resonant, when a normal finding would be just resonant. Okay, now moving on to signs and symptoms of chronic bronchitis. In contrast to patients with emphysema, these patients might be obese. Again, they have hypoxemia. They might be cyanotic. So these uh, pink puppers over here are more reddish in complexion, where the chronic bronchitis patients are also called the blue bloaters because they all appear cyanotic. They'll have excessive mucus production, and that is because of all this destruction that's happening and the inflammation that they have going on chronically. So they have excessive mucus production, and a lot of times you can hear that in their cough, the kind of a wet sounding cough. And with that goes ronchi or wheezing. Remember, whenever you have mucus moving around in the airways, it can be heard as lung sounds as ronchi. They might have some wheezing because this inflammation kind of like in asthma patients. They will also have an increase in their um, hemoglobin level and chronic bronchitis because all of this obstruction going on. So now we have something that's obstructing the blood flow to the lungs because we're just not really perfusing well and the oxygen exchange can't happen. So that can lead to right-sided heart failure. And whenever right-sided heart failure occurs because of a pathology that's originating in the lungs, it's also called core pulmonal. So um, because of a pulmonary mechanism that's, that's causing it. And with that, think of right-sided heart failure, patients will have peripheral edema as well. Now, risk factors for COPD, either one of those two are smoking and environmental exposure for both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And then for emphysema here in pink, it color codes, it matches, there is something called an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's a pretty rare disorder. Um, and the patients uh, don't produce, produce this alpha-1 antitrypsin, and then they will lose that elastic recall, just like in patients with emphysema. Now, diagnosis is usually made based on symptoms, but of course, we might also want to visualize their chest with a chest x-ray or a CT of the chest. And pulmonary function test, I put a star here. That's the golden standard for diagnosing these respiratory disorders. Of course, if the patient is in distress or has an exacerbation, we might want to look at an ABG, see how they're doing. A sputum culture, if they have an acute infection and we want to see if there's maybe a bacterial or viral infection going on. And then that alpha-1 antitrypsin test if we're suspicious that they have emphysema because of this deficiency. Complications. So remember, these are very chronic, these conditions happen over years and years of chronic exposure. 
So these patients are at higher risk for respiratory infections because their, their normal protective mechanisms of the lungs, the cilia that propel the, any kind of inhaled irritants out or um, all this mucus production puts them at higher risk for respiratory infections. Now they're also at risk for pneumothorax because now if the alveoli are so distended, they can burst and then the air escapes in the pleural cavity and now a segment of the lung can, can become basically open, causing a pneumothorax, which is also a collapsed lung. Uh, certainly it can use to cancer, smoking specifically, and then right-sided heart failure, respiratory failure, and eventually death. <coughs> Excuse me. Now treatment for these patients, stop smoking or stop the exposure to the environmental pollutants is really the number one, number one goal here. Now for medications, they will use beta adrenergic agonists, which is basically the albuterol, a bronchodilator, because if we have airway construct, constriction and obstruction, and these airways collapse, we want to make sure that we dilate the bronchioles so that more air can travel to the alveoli and perform that gas exchange. And they might also be using anticholinergic medications. Keep in mind that cholinergic usually pertains to the parasympathetic nervous system. So now if it's anticholinergic, we want to block the parasympathetic nervous system. So we want to allow the bronchioles to open up and dilate. And I put here, there's a combination, which is called a combivent, hence combination, which is a combination between the albuterol and the atrovent, and a lot of patients will need that. Now, the difference is that adrenergic works on the sympathetic nervous system, cholinergic on the parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic response is a little bit faster versus parasympathetic is slower, but these patients might be um, needing both nervous systems to be helping with the bronchodilation for these chronic conditions. Now they might also need an ICS, an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, if they have frequent exacerbations that require hospitalization or they, they just, um, maybe it's winter season and there's a bad cough and cold season. And they might even require oral steroids if the exacerbations happen very frequently or it's late in their disease. And then certainly they might also be needing O2 at home. And it's okay for them to have an O2 sat that's between 88 and 92%. So don't uh, panic if you see a patient with an O2 sat of 90%, for example, and they're actually looking that they're okay. It's always okay to ask them, do you have any kind of lung disorders? And then they might tell you, yes, I have emphysema. Yes, I have chronic bronchitis. And you might even want to ask them the normal O2 sat level. And then they say, oh, it's usually 90 and they look perfectly fine at that at that O2 set. Now let's look at nursing care for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So first of all, we want to encourage them to smoke, to stop smoking. And keep in mind, this is not going to be an easy task because a lot of times these patients have been smoking for decades or, you know, many, many years. That is a very difficult habit to stop doing. So they're going to need a lot of encouragement maybe all kinds of other disciplines have to be involved to help with that. And then we're going to have to help them with some breathing retraining. And I wrote down here, pursed lip breathing and diaphragmatic breathing. And so the way that the pursed lip breathing works is basically you ask the patient to exhale through pursed lips as if they were exhaling through a whistling. So they would inhale, and then exhale and what that does because of the narrowed oral cavity now there's increased pressure that is needed to exhale the co2 which will help deflate that bleb that alveolus that is so distended and help them get rid of some of that co2 and then diaphragmatic breathing the diaphragm is the major muscle of breathing and we really want to encourage them to strengthen that so that they inhale by using kind of like the muscles of the belly to, to inflate the kind of like the belly button, which 
helps to bring the diaphragm down and allows for lung expansion and then as the diaphragm recoils it allows them to help to expel the air now coughing and deep breathing certainly will help as well as chest physiotherapy specifically in patients with chronic bronchitis who have a lot of that mucus production that we talked about now nutrition think about if somebody has these chronic disorders they might be chronically short of breath and all their energy goes into breathing so they are not even gonna have time or, or the effort to really be hungry because just eating the motions of eating will make them so tired that they can't breathe so now we have to focus on how can we get nutrition into these patients that are really chronically ill so a recommendation would be resting 30 minutes before the meal so no activity at all and also using a bronchodilator right before the meal so that the lungs can expand and then there will be less effort to breathe while eating they might need an increased protein and high calorie diet as well as to consume small frequent meals because again they get tired very easily and then there's a specialty called pulmonary rehab and that's basically where specifically trained nurses and respiratory therapists work together to work on all these techniques with the patient now i also wrote down here the hypoxic drive because that's always something that comes up in discussion when we're talking about copd and there's a, a saying that if you give a patient with copd too much oxygen they will stop breathing and so i wanted to discuss the mechanism behind that so in a normal individual without any lung disorders when the pa the blood ph decreases um, or the co2 level increases or the pao2 decreases that's what stimulates us to to, to breathe and that's um, accomplished by central chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata as well as peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries that kind of provide feedback and then remember that the pH balance helps or takes place when the respiratory and the renal system work together to excrete bicarbonate hydrogen ion and CO2 which is our acid here in the respiratory system so in a normal patient what stimulates ventilation is a decrease in PO2 an increase in CO2 or a decrease in PaO2 now the problem that we discussed over here is that these patients with emphysema already have too much CO2 in their system so that kind of becomes their new normal so they are CO2 retainers and because of that ink that that continuous chronic increased level of co2 they're in a constant state of respiratory acidosis but their kidneys have adjusted so their kidneys are now used to helping getting rid of some of that hydrogen ion and absorbing more of the bicarbonate to balance their ph and um, now this normal mechanism where a decrease in o2 or increase in co2 stimulates ventilation is no longer valid in patients with copd but now if we give them O2 because of these receptors react a little bit differently by administering O2 to these patients it might decrease their respiratory drive and it might decrease their respiratory rate and therefore they stop breathing now I'm not saying that if a patient presents who has a history of COPD and they come to you and all of a sudden they have an O2 sat of 65 percent and they are struggling to breathe they can barely talk they're using accessory muscles that you shouldn't give them oxygen i'm not saying that this patient most likely the way that i just described him or her will need a lot of other measures and maybe even be put on mechanical ventilation if that's within their wishes but keep in mind the mechanisms of normal what drives the respiration and gas exchange in copd are not like in anybody with healthy lungs and therefore we want to be cautious with o2 administration and a lot of times they only be on one two maybe three liters of oxygen per nasal cannula if they need it for home care and then anything else has to be discussed very much in detail with their physician or their pulmonologist to regulate that 
So I hope this has helped you clarify the concepts of emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and how it applies to our patient population. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Hi guys, welcome to Empower In. My name is Caroline Porter Thomas. Thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to go over a disease process that you're going to see a lot in nursing school, and you're also going to see this most likely on your job, and that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In this video, I've done my best to simplify the complicated process, and I've also created other videos that go over nursing exam style questions. And also, you can go to my website, which you can find a link right here, and you can take questions, which will help you further understand the disease process and expose you to the type of questions that you might be tested on in nursing school and also on the NCLEX. So I really hope that all of these resources help you out a ton. If you like this video and you want to see more videos like this, please do me a favor and give the video a thumbs up. Alright guys, without any further ado, let's get started and let's go over chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which you will see abbreviated many times as COPD, is the term term used for two different chronic lung diseases, which hinder breathing by limiting lung airflow and becoming severe with time. According to the CDC, it is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. In the United States, around 24 million individuals are affected by COPD, and over half of them have symptoms and do not know it. Early screening is key to diagnosing someone with COPD before major loss of lung function occurs. Pathophysiology. In order to understand the progression of COPD, we need to understand the structure and functioning of the respiratory system. During the breathing process, air enters the main windpipe. This windpipe divides into two smaller branches called bronchial tubes. Each bronchial tube goes to one of the two lungs, where they are divided into numerous smaller branches, known as bronchioli. Bronchiolus are fine branches with tiny air sacs at the end. These balloon-like air sacs are called alveoli. During inhalation, alveoli stretches and fills with air, and during exhalation, they shrink again. Alveoli are surrounded with a network of tiny blood capillaries, which is the main site of gaseous exchange in the respiratory system. When the inhaled air reaches the alveoli, oxygen is transferred to the blood capillaries through the alveolar walls, and carbon dioxide is removed from the blood and transferred to the air sacs to be exhaled out of the body. And there you have the normal breathing process. In the case of COPD, some changes in the respiratory tract cause the volume of inhaled and exhaled air to be reduced. These changes can be one or more of the following. Clogging of air passages due to mucus, inflammation or thickening of the walls of air passages, damaged alveolar walls, and alveoli in air passages losing the ability to stretch. There are two types of COPD that may cause these damages, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In the case of emphysema, the main damage takes place in the alveolar walls. When the walls between the different alveoli are destroyed, the alveoli lose shape, and it also results in larger and fewer air sacs instead of many tiny ones. This reduces the total surface area for gaseous exchange. The lungs reduce their efficiency, and the volume of air exchanged is decreased. In the case of chronic bronchitis, the lining of air passages are clogged with mucus or phlegm due to chronic inflammation, irritation, and swelling. This hinders breathing. It is common for both emphysema and chronic bronchitis to occur together, which is why generally the term COPD is used for both. Causes most cases of COPD are caused by inhaling pollutants. That includes smoking cigarettes and pipes and secondhand smoke, fumes, chemicals and dust found in some work environments, 
can contribute to many people having COPD. Smoking, however, is the most common cause of COPD. Prolonged exposure to lung irritants can destroy air passages and lungs. Air pollution, dust and chemicals, and chemical fumes from the environment or workplace can also cause COPD, but they are less common. Difficult to understand genetics can also play a role in an individual's development of COPD. Even if the person has never smoked or has been exposed to strong lung irritants in the workplace, there is a genetic condition known as alpha-1 antitryptism deficiency, which can also contribute in the development of COPD. However, it is very rare. People with this condition are deficient of alpha-1 antitryptism, also known as AAT, which is a protein made in the liver. Accompanied with smoking or lung irritants, this condition can destroy the lungs and cause COPD. Signs and and symptoms. COPD is a progressive disease. In the early stages, there may be no symptoms or they may be very ordinary and mild ones. But with the progression of the disease, more severe symptoms start to appear. Common signs and symptoms can be a persistent cough for three or more months, accompanied with the production of thick mucus, which gets worse during the early mornings. Dyspnea, which is a medical term that means shortness of breath, especially during physically demanding activities. Frequent respiratory infections like flus, colds, and pneumonia, tightness in the chest, wheezing, and fatigue. Advanced COP symptoms can include difficulty with talking and breathing at the same time, fevers and headaches due to high carbon dioxide levels in the blood, cyanosis, which is a bluish or grayish colored lips or fingernails. This is due to low oxygen levels in the blood and a barrel chest-like appearance swollen feet and ankles, weight loss, lack of mental alertness, and clubbing of the fingers. Diagnosis. Diagnosis of COPD is done by a specialist using test results, physical examinations, medical history of the family, and other relative data gathered through questioning the patient. Spirometry. Spirometry is a painless test used to confirm the presence of COPD. For this test, a spirometer is used to find out the volume volume of air inhaled and exhaled by the person and how fast the air moves in and out of the lungs. The doctor may also suggest other tests, including chest CT scans and x-rays to help provide visual pictures of the lungs and see if they show any signs of COPD, if any. An arterial blood gas could also be done. It is a blood test to measure the level of oxygen in the blood. It helps determine the severity of COPD and whether oxygen therapy is required or not. Treatment. The damage is irreversible, but medications and changing lifestyle can slow down the progression of the disease and help the patient live a normal life. Things like quitting smoking and avoiding lung irritants are the main steps to treat COPD. For help in quitting smoking, the individual can join a support group. Medications. There are many different types of medications used to treat the symptoms and complications of COPD. These can include bronchodilators. Bronchodilators relieves coughing and shortness of breath and assists in breathing. They are usually sold with inhalers. Examples of bronchodilators are short-acting, Atrovent, Levibuterol, Zopinex, Ventolin HFA, Pro-Air, and long-acting dilators can include Tudorza, Cerevent, Brovia, Spiriva, Aricapta, and Performist. Also, inhaled steroids can reduce inflammation of the air passages and prevent exacerbations. Examples of these could be Pulmacort and Flovent. Combination inhalers are a combination of bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. Examples of these include Simbacort, Advair, and Selmetrol. Phosphodiazertate inhibitors is a new drug used to treat severe COPD. It reduces inflammation of the air passages and helps them relax. A name of this type of drug includes Dalaresp. 
Theophylline is an inexpensive medication that prevents exacerbations and makes breathing easier. It can have side effects such as rapid heart rate, tremors, and nausea. Oral steroids help prevent further damage and moderate or severe acute exacerbations of COPD. Oral steroids may exhibit serious side effects such as diabetes, weight gain, cataracts, osteoporosis, and vulnerability to infections. Antibiotics are used to treat acute exacerbations by fighting respiratory infections, including acute bronchitis, influenza, and pneumonia, which can otherwise intensify COPD manifestations. Lung therapies. Patients with moderate or severe COPD may require additional therapies, such as supplemental oxygen. Supplemental oxygen is given to patients with low oxygen levels in the blood. There are several lightweight portable devices available on the market that are used to provide oxygen to the lungs. It is the only COPD therapy proven to extend life and improve quality of life. Pulmonary rehabilitation program may also be an option. It is based on a combination of education, nutrition advice, exercise training, and counseling to fulfill every COPD patient's individual requirements. The program may help reduce hospitalization periods and enable clients to live more active lives and improve their quality of life. Surgery. Certain patients with acute emphysema for whom medication alone is not enough may have to go through surgery. These surgeries can include lung volume reduction surgery. This surgery is used to remove small wedges of damaged lung tissue to create extra space in the chest cavity. This helps the remaining lung tissue and the diaphragm to work more efficiently and thus potentially extending life and improving the quality of life. A bullet ectomy can also be performed. Remember, whenever you see the letters ectomy at the end of a word, it means the removal of. A bullectomy is when the alveolar walls are damaged. Larger air spaces are formed known as bulla. Bulla can be so large that it can hinder breathing. A bullectomy is a surgery which is used to remove one or more large bulla from the lungs. Lung transplant. A lung transplant is recommended only to certain patients who meet certain criteria. Lung transplants improves breathing and helps to live an active life. However, it is a major operation and so there are considerable risks associated with it, such as organ rejection, in which case the organ receiver has to take immune suppressing medications for the rest of his life. Prevention. Prevention is always better than the cure. The main cause of COPD is smoking, so the best prevention of COPD is to never start smoking or to quit as soon as possible. In the case of difficulty quitting smoking, you can advise your patient to consult the doctor about products or programs that can help them quit. Another preventative measure is avoidance of lung irritants, such as air pollutants, secondhand smoke, dust, chemicals, and fumes. When the disease progresses, it is important for the nurse to inform the patient when he or she should call 911 for help. Advise them to call when they can't walk and talk at the same time, or when they can't walk or talk in general, when their heart beats very fast or has an irregular beat, if their lips or fingernails turn blue, if he breathes fast and hard, even when on medications. Alright guys, I really hope that you enjoyed that video going over COPD. Like I mentioned before, we're going to go over a nursing exam or NCLEX style questions in video format. But remember to make sure you go to the website which you can find the link right here and you can take the nursing exam or NCLEX style quiz right away. All right, I cannot wait to see you guys in the next video and also again, please do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up if you like this video, if it helped you out at all or if any of my videos have helped you out at all. And also remember to leave a video request if you have any so that I can make sure I create videos that you need. All right, I love you guys so much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.